Hello, Bookworms of Concord, Pastor Beckett here with a different kind of video. Uh, if you're new to the channel, uh, Bookworms of Concord, as the name suggests, and if you've seen kind of the list of videos with all the book reviews, uh, the channel is all about reading. Um, I love to read uh, anywhere from sci-fi to fantasy fiction, and of course, theology, as I am a pastor, so of course, I like to read theology. Um, but every now and then, I would... I <clears throat> Do, would like to do uh, book recommendations as well as some uh, educational stuff for um, for lay people, um, things that are easy for you guys to understand. So uh, as you can see in the title of this video, uh, I'd like to uh, teach a little bit about how to read the Psalms. Okay, so reading, how do you read the Psalms? This is, uh, whenever you're reading any part of scripture, you always have to keep in mind all right, what is the genre? What genre am I reading? Is it, uh, is it a historical narrative like the Torah or as we usually call it, the Pentateuch? Uh, the Gospels are uh, a historical narrative and there's other um, kind of uh, different literary stuff put in there as well, like, like the parables um, is its own genre. Uh, Revelation is, you know, Greek apocalyptic literature, which is why it reads so different. And of course, you got the Psalms, which is poetry. So, how do you read uh, poetry, especially Hebrew poetry? So, the first thing um, I, I got a list of four things on how to read the Psalms. And the first thing, which will take up the majority of this video, because there's a lot of subparts to this, is um, slow down. So that's number one is slow down, okay? Um, slow down as you're reading. If if you're a, a fast reader like I am, I, I don't know if I'm kind of medium to fast. It de depends on what I'm reading. Um, slow down, uh, especially when it comes to poetry. You're not reading an essay, all right? So slow down. There's a couple parts to this. Uh, the first is the first thing to consider as you slow down is what's the historical context. Uh, if any, sometimes there might not be, right? Um, and in Psalm one, um, it, there seems to be no, really, no historical context until you get to um, the wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Well, what is chaff? Um, what does that mean? What, it, what would that mean in Israel's context and so forth? Uh, other psalms are more helpful. They have. Uh, if you're reading, you know, an English translation, uh, usually there's some sort of a, a header, which is not in the original uh, Hebrew or the Greek when you're in the New Testament. The superscription, if you're reading in Hebrew, is uh, verse 1. Um, the superscription is um, actually in, um, if, if we're going to read it, we usually read the Masoretic text um, if we're reading Hebrew. Um, the superscription, it gives you kind of background information like Psalm 51, for example, tells you um, when, you know, David committed a sin with Bathsheba, basically, however that's worded. So that tells you, all right, I ought to read the psalm in the context of David's sin and his repentance because it is a penitent psalm. Uh, so consider that. What is the historical context, if any? Um and, part, and the other part of slowing down is to read it out loud. Um, and I say this because, particularly because of Psalm 1, verse 2, uh, talking about the blessed man, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. That Hebrew word for meditate is interesting. It can be, you can get to a translation of meditate, uh, but it more literally means um, to mutter or to utter or even to groan so it's a regardless of how you translate it it's a uh it's a verb it's a not verbal it's a it's an oral uh word it's something you do with your mouth so that's why i say to read the psalms out loud uh if of course if you're in a context to do so um if you're if you're reading i don't know if you're at lunch at a restaurant somewhere and you want to read uh, a psalm for the day, you, you might look weird <laughs> reading a psalm out loud. Um, so read it out loud and also read it more than once, okay? Twice at the minimum. Uh, 
the other thing, uh, part of slowing down is um, what words or patterns stick out to you? Okay, so, and you, that, you'll notice that more as you're reading it two or more times, um, paying attention to specific words that just pop out to you for whatever reason, and take note of any patterns, because uh, patterns do happen quite frequently in the Psalms. Uh, the other thing to take note of is uh, pay, paying attention to different, different poetic device, devices that are used. For example, uh, what metaphors are being used, uh, what similes, um, is there a synecdoche that is being used? So a synecdoche is uh, a part that is used for the whole. For example, yeah, to let uh, a synecdoche commonly used today, we go, hey, check out my wheels. And what you mean is check out my car. The wheels are the part of the whole car. And so the wheels is are representing the car. So that's a synecdoche. Uh, also, is there a um, another poetic device, a uh, metonymy? And a metonymy is a substitution of a name or an attribute. For example, uh, a very common metonymy in not just in the Psalms, but really all over the scriptures um, is uh, Zion, which is standing in it. It's a synonym for for uh, Jerusalem, but it can also stand in the place of all of Israel. That's a metonymy. Zion, this single city, is a representative of all the people of Israel. That is a metonymy. A, a common one we, we use today is when we say the White House or the Oval Office to refer to the President of the United States. Um, and the lastly is, um, as you slow down, to so consider parallelism. And there are different types of parallelisms, and this is what's going to take up most of Part 1. Um, but before we get into specific parallelisms, um, it's good to, uh, you ought to kind of understand just the very basics of what makes up a psalm. So the first thing, uh, so the first word you should learn is kola, C-O-L-A. A kola is basically like a, a whole unit of a psalm. So for example, Psalm 1, verse 1. Verse 1 is a uh, kola, uh, and it's made up of individual colons. Uh, so I got, got it right here for you. So this is Psalm 1, verse 1, right? Here's the whole cola, verse 1, and then cola 1, or colon 1, colon 2, colon 3, and then colon 4. Uh, you don't really need to have that in mind as you're reading, but just something to be aware of. This is how um, psalms are written. So that's a cola of a psalm. And so now we're going to get into some um, poetic devices, uh, including the parallelisms. But two things before we get into specific parallelisms. Um, one thing is uh, pay attention to if there's a ballast that's being used. Um, so a ballast is um, a heavy uh, substance that's placed in a certain way to provide stability, like the, the, like the ballast of a ship, for example. Um, when it happens in a psalm, uh, it basically is telling you to stop and ponder this. And I have two examples. Uh, Psalm 130, verse 6, and Psalm 30, uh, 131, verse 2. So Psalm 130, verse 6. Uh, so I have to read it this way because uh, um, it's reversed when I'm looking at the camera and I can't read backwards. So my, so my soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. And Psalm 131, verse 2, But I have calmed and quieted my soul, like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. So the ballast, the ballast. Uh, giving so-called stability to the psalm, telling you, stop and ponder this. So when you read this, stop and ponder what this might mean. What this might mean to the psalmist, and of course, as you apply it to yourselves, what it, what it might mean to you. All right, so that's a ballast. Next, uh, we got a chiasm. Um, so chiasm is basically uh, ideas that are put forth, and then uh, those ideas are repeated in reverse. So it might be something like... Uh, um, 
A, B, B, A, and then A, B, B, A, or A, B, C, D, E, D, C, B, A. Um, if you were to look at this up, a lot of commentators will have chiasms that don't have a reverse order on the second half, uh, which, unless I'm understanding biblical chiasms uh, wrong, um, that is not truly a chiasm. A chiasm must have a reverse order. Um, so one example here is uh, Psalm 46. So you got A, B, C for two verses, then D, then, uh, then E, D, C, B, A. So A, uh, you got God is refuge, right? Uh, and then B is uh, no fear. C, um, God rules over natural uh, calamities. Okay. Then D, I believe, yeah, God is with us is D. And then E is basically the main thought, uh, which here is uh, you know, the nations rage and then God speaks. And then it, it, it um, goes in reverse order. Um, so after the main thought, God is with us, Emmanuel. Right. And then uh, God rules over political calamity. Uh, so this is a great psalm to read in our political, our current political climate. <clears throat> and then uh, no fear uh, stated in a uh, similar or uh, well, uh, distinct different way. Um, be still. And then ending with the concluding thought, God is here. Uh, so this is a great example of a chiasm. By the way, feel free to pause uh, to take um, notes in your own Bible uh, in the, uh, during the video if um, you so choose. So next now we're going to get into uh, parallelisms. Um, the first is linear parallelism, which is basically just um, this starting with an idea and just, and just running with it. So it's like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, so on and so forth. It might continue beyond G. Um, so I got an example here, Psalm 1, 146, 5 through 9. So see, I got it written here with uh, each colon, uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And then uh, it basically gives, it starts with a different um, a idea, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So I thought this would be another part of uh, linear par parallelism. Uh, and, you know, the... The clue for verses five through seven is, uh, you know, the, the who. Um, Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose help is in the Lord is God, who made heaven and earth, right? The sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever and so forth. Uh, and I, I figured it'd be good to start another linear parallelism here because it changes a little bit. Um, the Lord is now the subject, Yahweh, all right? The Lord sets the prisoners free. It's always like Yahweh in a verb, Yahweh in a verb, Yahweh does this, right? So this is, you got linear parallel, parallelism here. Next is synonymous parallelism, uh, which is when the second colon repeats the thought of the first, right? Or it might be, um, yeah, second calling repeats the thought of the first. So Psalm 148, verses 1 and 2. So from the heavens is um, the first, and then it repeats the heights, because the heavens are up, right? Uh, and then in verse 2, uh, the second um, synonymous parallelism is his angels and then his hosts. Um they're the same, uh, they're the same group, but it's, uh, they're, uh, syn and they're synonymous to each other, right? Um, and then it actually happens, uh, it does this throughout the rest of the psalm. It's a very, very short psalm. Uh, next is antithetical parallelism, which is uh, usually how it happens is you got the first colon and then the second colon gives an antithetical thought. Um, and it's very easy. This is probably the easiest to uh, note as you're reading um, because it usually starts with but. Uh, so Psalm 1-6. 
All right. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So this is antithetical parallelism. Okay. Next, synthetic or step parallelism. This happens when um, an additional thought is given. These uh, probably might be maybe one of the hardest to notice. Um, the only one I could really think of was Psalm 24, verses 3 to 4. So you got verse 3. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? I'll try to read it backwards. And who shall stand in his holy place? And then there's, this is, there's the addition, the synthetic part. Uh, so the psalmist answers his own question. Um, that's the addition. Our penultimate... Um, Yes, not our penal, but penultimate. The last one is called climactic parallelism. And as the name might suggest, um, or not might, it does suggest it. Uh, so you start building up to a climax. And an example here is Psalm 8. So you got verse 3. It's just building, 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 building up to the climax, right? Um, when I look at your heavens... The work of your hands, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. Now the climax. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Uh, so these are some parallelisms to uh, keep in mind as you're reading. So that's all that is number one. Uh, slow down. Again, what's the historical context? Is there a superscription that, that tells you? Read it out loud and more than once, a minimum of two times. Uh, what words or patterns stick out to you? Uh, pay attention to poetic devices like um, the parallelisms, metaphors, similes, synecdoches, metonymies, and so, and so forth. So that's just number one is slowing down. Number two, what emotions or thoughts does the psalm evoke? as you're reading it. So for example, reading Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Now every time I read this, and it might be the same for you, but once I get to verse 2, it evokes in motion to me, like, who... Who the heck can meditate on the, on the law of the Lord day and night? Right? This is the blessed man does this, but I don't. Am I blessed? Uh, and, and so there's a couple of things here, you know, uh, for, for me as I've meditated on this, right? Um, the way I always read this is, you know, for me personally, uh, God's word is always on my mind throughout the day. Uh, uh, I might might not be thinking about it you know, constantly, like literally every second. But whenever something happens um, in conversation or life, whatever it is, I'm thinking about God's word. What does God's word say about this? Um, so I think in that way you can understand of meditating, meditating on the Lord day and night. Um, so that's kind of more of a, prover a proverbial way of thinking about it. But of course, literally, no one, not even, not even I, can meditate on the law, law of the Lord day and night. Um, but you know who does? Jesus. So I'll stop there. We'll get there in a second. So what emotions or thoughts does the psalm evoke? And that's number two. Number three. What human situation does the psalm speak to? So Psalm 51, the great one, a penitential psalm. Psalm it's a beautiful psalm of repentance. We sing it in our liturgy, right? Um, it's in that psalm, David is experiencing immense guilt. He is distraught over his sin. That's the human situation he's speaking to is guilt, shame, uh, distress, right? So have that in mind. What human situation does a psalm speak to? And then lastly, number four, where is Christ in the psalm? And this is the most important. You know, Jesus said the prophets and the Psalms are about him. They, right? They testify about him. So 
where is Christ in the psalm? And as I, um, to get to what I was saying earlier, uh, Psalm 1, where is Christ in Psalm 1? Jesus is the one who meditates on the law of the Lord day and night, right? Jesus is the one who does this for us because we can't. We fail at this miserably, right? Um, and you might even, uh, as you read the rest of Psalm 1, um, so therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The way of the righteous. What is the way of the righteous? Now, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the way of the righteous. And because you know, the sheep hear his voice and they follow him, right, as Jesus says, um, that is the way. And Obviously, God the Father, he knows his only begotten son, Jesus. And because we follow him, he, who is the way, he knows us because of Jesus. Uh, and of course, he knows us in his omniscience, but he knows us especially in Christ, which is why our way does not perish, because we are in the way of Christ, who did not perish, but rose again on the third day for our, just, our justification. So, there you have it. Breaking it down again, number one, slow down. Two, what emotions or thoughts does the psalm evoke? Three, what human situation does the psalm speak to? And four, where is Christ in the psalm? Well, thank you. I hope this video was uh, helpful and at least a little bit educational for you. Uh, as always, please like, share, and subscribe to get the word out about um, my new channel and uh, to get notified when a new video comes up. Uh, thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.